Uh, like Ben said, I'm Justin Brown. I'm a religious studies major, and my research was I did my research at the Sri Venkateshwara Temple in Cary, North Carolina, and I both interviewed people and compared these interviews with two books I read. Um, one is called Real Sadhus Sing to God by Antoinette DiNapoli, and the other is called Women in Ochre Robes by um, Lena Kandel Mila Kandelwal. I thought it was Lena Kandelwal because Lena's sitting right there. Um, <laughs> And what I really did was I read these two books, or at least got most of the way through these two books before I really started interviewing, and I let themes I found that in these books guide my questions a little bit. So I asked people at the Sri Venkateshwara Temple um, what they think constitutes a good life, where in the like, Hindu textual strata they find this good life, what they think about these four stages of life, what they think about people who subvert these four stages of life, which are called sadhus. And for just clarity's sake, these four bullet points, which are italicized and hard to read because they're kind of jumbly and Hindu, um, they are, these are the four stages of life. Vanaprastha and sannyasa are the two I concentrated on. Vanaprastha literally translates to forest dweller. Traditionally, it's someone who literally goes into a forest and dwells. And sannyasa is a renunciant, or, or I call a sadhu, or one who gives up the world, is the way to translate it. So some of my research questions were, um, does gender change how people view these four stages of life, this four stages of life model? Does it affect how people see renunciants? And I also asked people um, where, they get, where they get their information in the whole textual strata of Hindu text, where they get the information about how to live a good life. And I put good life in quotations because that's kind of complicated in itself. Um, what I found was that people I interviewed either gave me this model verbatim, which I was instantly really impressed about, or they tended to combine the Vanaprastha and sannyasa stages in sort of a modern context to mean retirement, which I also found really interesting. Um, when I asked people about sadhus, some people kind of knew about them, some people really knew about them, and one person in particular who I found really interesting gave me this narrative of these real sadhus who are spiritually wonderful and help others, and then these fake sadhus who run their, like, he used the term like a business. They run their they run their selves like a business. And then the text question was as complicated as I thought it would be. When I asked people where they got their information for their text, they said from older text, from newer text, from both, from neither. So that was just proof that how complicated the good life is. Ready? Mm -hmm. Hi, so I'm Rachel Shippey. I'm a double major in international studies and English with a minor in Spanish. And for my research, I completed a comparative analysis between two culturally and historically rooted women's social movements in Argentina. So I had the opportunity to study abroad for five months in Buenos Aires. And during that time, I utilized interviews and a lot of participatory observation to conduct my research. And the purpose of this was to look at the effectiveness of two social movements in Argentina and to kind of examine specific characteristics of both and how they're able to change gender perceptions in Argentina and contribute to the advancement of women's rights. So a very, very quick overview of the two social movements I looked at. The first was Las Madres de Plaza de Mayo, which began in direct relation to the 1976 to 1983 military dictatorship. And this regime was really looking for this process of national reorganization and to eliminate subversion. And they did so in taking to mass kidnappings, torturings, and executions of a lot of young people in Argentina at that time. Um, and they were, you know, in their 20s and 30s, they were journalists and politicians and teachers. And in doing so, their mothers started looking for them and wanted answers from authorities. And the authorities didn't really give them any information. So they took to the streets and began to protest at La Plaza de Mayo, which is this huge um, plaza. It's a very well-known political public space in Argentina. And very quickly, these mothers and housewives transformed into political activists. And to this day, they still march every Thursday at 3.30 at La Plaza de Mayo. The second one is Los Encuentros Nacionales de Mujeres, um, and it began in 1986 and still continues today as an annual three-day conference in Argentina in different areas. I actually had the opportunity while I was abroad to go um, for the three days, and it's a really empowering experience where women come together and take part in workshops and discuss you know, what does it mean to be a woman, what does it mean to be a feminist, and what does sexuality mean for us, and really have these great conversations and it ends as this big commemorative march at the end to address um, what's going on for women in Argentina during that time. So while I was there, they were working to legalize abortion and really talking about reproductive rights. Um, and so with my findings, I looked at kind of the overarching idea of collective action 
and how successful that can be in creating social and political change. So one of the ideas that I found was lo personal es politico, which translates to the personal is political. So both of these social movements utilize the idea that um, an individual's personal experiences of suffering or discrimination belongs in this political collective problem. So the individual becomes a part of this collective and really empowers them from the personal becoming the political. With Las Madres, they all have this oral testimony of the loss of their children, and they utilize this to become part of this, you know, how this regime has oppressed, you know, all of society. And with Los Encuentros, during these workshops, they're able to see how, um, you know, their daily instances of discrimination as women is a part of this bigger systematic oppression against women. Um, and they really feel empowered to realize that they're a part of this bigger collective group. Um, and in doing so, this concept also adheres to the idea of the mobilization of women from the private to the public sphere. So Las Madres did this really, really well um, by mobilizing themselves into this new space that women hadn't utilized before. Um, and it, uh, Las Madres really opened it up for Los Encuentros and this bigger feminist movement that exists today. And then the second idea that I really touched upon was poner el cuerpo. Um, and that means to put the body, and it's used in the context of putting the body um, in resistance and kind of putting it on the line in political protest. And political protest is a huge aspect, not only of Latin American culture, but of these two social movements. So Las Madres protests every Thursday at 3.30 at La Plaza de Mayo, and Los Encuentros utilizes that big march to really empower all these women. So it's utilizing the body not only in a collective group, but also realizing to reclaim your own body kind of in this autonomous, um, way to reclaim your rights or to realize that these women have the right to have rights. Hi, I'm Lena. I am a double major in strategic communications and international studies and uh, this research project was actually a student collaborative project with Dr. Musa and we used ethnography to understand Africans specifically communities coming from Sudan, Democratic Republic of Congo and Eritrea, and Asian, specifically communities coming from Bhutan, refugee resettlement in Greensboro, as a pathway to a community-based participatory impact assessment. So the larger guiding question of our study was, how are the resettlement expectations, the needs of refugee communities coming from various cultures and contexts addressed in the first three months after their arrival in the US. And we specifically looked at the three months um, because for many resettlement agencies, this 90-day period is the allot of, allotted time for their involvement in directly assisting refugees achieve that self-sufficiency through support and finding employment, health services, residency, and community. Um, so to simplify the many umbrella of questions that came from this larger question, we looked at how resettlement and self-sufficiency was defined and conceptualized by First, those working for these resettlement agencies, and second, the refugees themselves. Um, and we looked at how those narratives compare within refugee groups and how they compare with, between the caseworker and the refugee. Um, and to answer this, we conducted semi-structured in-depth interviews and with both caseworkers as well as refugees, and also participant observation at the agencies and refugee residential spaces. Um, some of our preliminary findings include um, this kind of shared understanding between agency workers as well as refugees that 90 days is simply not enough uh, to achieve self-sufficiency. And there seems to be a disconnect between the refugees who define self-sufficiency as this long-term prolonged um, system process that requires sustained support because this is what their understanding of support <coughs> has been shaped as, as they're coming from uh, <coughs> refugee camps from all over the world. This is their understanding of what support means to them. Um, and then this, in co co contrast to the caseworkers who, based on the nature of their job, um, defined it as a checklist of items to complete within the first 90 days. So due to the rush nature of the resettlement process, we found very negative associations to that 90-day policies by refugees and how um, the, their current successes and their current status in society um, is separate from the organization because of those feelings of dissent. Um, and then another um, finding we found is that in terms of defining resettlement, we saw a disconnect between the caseworkers who conceptualize the process as of resettlement as the only viable solution and the last resort for refugees, while many refugees themselves consider the movement from um, their refugee camp or their home country as a forced migration. So from their homeland, another movement, a step in their journey um, due to prosecution and a search for better future. And they're unable to immediately grasp 
or adopt that last ad uh, um, last resort mindset that they're introduced to once they come to the United States. Um, and so these very different initial understandings we found have contributed to severe depression among some, some community groups, such as the Bhutanese community, who face difficulty in translating their understandings of self-sufficiency, their understanding of resettlement, um, with that of the agencies. So what this highlights is a need for um, recognition that terms are different based on people's lived experiences, and each refugee community is unique to how they conceptualize resettlement and how they conceptualize self-sufficiency. And during this panel, I'll speak more specifically about community groups and some of our findings from each of them, but this is a very um, brief run through of what we found. Hi everyone, so my name is Olaya. Um, I'm a senior here at Elon, major in international studies, and I did, um, my research is entitled Senegalese Migration Narratives from New York um, and Dakar. And so I spent six months in um, Dakar, Senegal, in a study abroad program, and while I was there, I was interviewing um, Senegalese who have family and friends who live abroad or um, who, who have migrated abroad. And then I also spent two months in New York, New York City interviewing Senegalese migrants um, there and about the stories that they share with each other and the stories that they share with um, family and friends back home. And so what I was looking at was the social construction of migrants and migration um, in the Senegalese transnational sphere, particularly through narratives. And the Senegalese transnational sphere encompasses everything that has to do with migration. Usually in um, migration literature, we find that most scholars typically concentrate on the migrants themselves rather than also looking at the sending context. And so the sending context is where those migrants are coming from. The family and friends they left behind, um, their socioeconomic statuses when they were um, there, and then what the reasons they left, things of that nature. And so that, that including the non-migrants, those who are waiting for the migrants back home, those who um, depend on the migrants' remittances or just depend on um, or like listen to stories of the migrants, they are also a part of the, trend, the Senegalese transnational sphere. Um, and so that's what I'm talking about when I say the Senegalese transnational sphere and encompassing all of that. And so for me, it was particularly important to be researching both sides because in order, every immigrant is also an immigrant. And so it's really, really important to understand both their sending context, where they're coming from, and their receiving context, where they go to, what they do when they get there, what their um, resettlement or their integration or their inter um, uh, acculturation is like. Um, and so that's, yeah. And so Senegal is particularly interesting because it's um, a lot of people do emigrate from Senegal. There in the 80s, there was a lot of, um, the IMF imposed a lot of structural adjustment in which the Senegalese government had to cut a lot of their public funding and so it was really hard to find jobs and unemployment is really high. And then there was also a um, drought in the rural area. Um, Senegal is very agriculturally based, the economy is, and so a lot of people had to go find other means to survive because there was just no, no jobs available either in the rural sector or in the public sector. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why a lot of people were emigrating in the first place. And so from there, there became this, this narrative came about of an El Dorado, of how the US and other Western nations were the El Dorado that you had to go to, where you would go to find all your riches and everything that you would need to make your life better and your life and your family. Um, but when I was interviewing people specifically in Senegal, they talked a lot about how um, this El Dorado does not exist. Or you know a lot, or the pe the people who believe in the El Dorado are naive and uneducated. They don't understand the hardships out there. They don't understand the economic crises um, that is around the world. And so, so basically, what it is is that El Dorado acts as this dominant narrative that everyone seems to believe, or my participants were telling me everyone believes, but they themselves don't believe it because they have all these challenge narratives that their family and friends are telling them from back home. And so it just poses El Dorado as this narrative that like, so if no one believes it, and you don't know anyone who believes it, who really owns this narrative? Where does this narrative fit into the Senegalese transnational sphere? And it was really interesting talking to people in Senegal who were saying, yeah, you know, I totally understand that you know, the US is, and other countries are not in El Dorado. It's not that easy to make it rich immediately. But then when you went to, when I was in New York, um, all the migrants there were saying, oh, my family and friends back home, they all think you know, the US is in El Dorado. They think I'm just living large and that I'm able to send money home constantly. And so there's this disconnect 
between those and the, the migrants who feel the pressure um, from home to send home money constantly um, and also just keep pushing this idea of an El Dorado and then the migrant, the non-migrants at home saying, no, they, they understand that the U.S. is an El Dorado. So just, yeah, yeah, that was um, one thing that I found that was interesting. Um, and then another thing that was interesting was this, like, this idea of the Southern Lakes dream. Um, so, you know, we think of the American dream, which is like, house and um, family and white picket fence, 2.5 kids, everything like that. The Senegalese dream is um, house and a job and a beautiful wife and um, you know the respect and admiration of your family and community members. And so that was just something that was reiterated a lot, like exactly in that context. And so I just thought that was very interesting. And it's also very interesting how gendered it is because migration is a very like male-dominated process although more women are becoming a part of it. Um, and so a lot of previous literature shows that migration equals success. And once you've migrated, that automatically it means that you're successful. But a lot of people were critiquing this idea, saying that rather um, migration was a means to achieving the Senegalese dream. And a lot of people, particularly in Senegal, were saying that perhaps there were other ways to achieve the Senegalese dream without migrating. Um, a lot of people were talking about, you know, um, so for example, my host mom, she was, she stayed home um, and she worked in, by home I mean Senegal, she stayed and worked in Senegal, but her husband moved to the US and he was struggling abroad. He wasn't even able to send money home often. And so she was saying how now her husband regrets um, moving abroad because a lot of his friends who stayed in Senegal and also herself, you know, have their house now, they have their car, they have their job, um, even though they never went abroad. And so that was just um, a very interesting narrative of achieving the Senegalese dream without migrating, although previously everyone thought that migrating equals achieving the Senegalese dream. Um, and then also the expectations and realities. Um, I've kind of already touched on that a little bit. Um, and so it was just the idea that the, the um, non-migrants were expecting so much from the the um, <coughs> migrants in New York, and they were expecting them to be able to re-meet as often as possible, but it really was not possible because of the realities that were being faced in New York. And so um, a lot of migrants in New York talk about how family and friends don't understand how expensive it is, how expensive it is to just call back home, um, and how expensive it is to even um, just maintain a lifestyle of like going to work, paying the bills, transporting around New York, and then also trying to support everyone back home. And so it was just a lot of disconnects between the understandings that the non-migrants have um, and that they express to me, and then the um, understanding that the migrants have that they feel the non-migrants don't understand. Great. Thank you everyone for these introductions. Um, our first theme is ethical dilemmas, and after a few minutes of prepared questions, we're gonna invite the audience to also participate. So as we're going through our questions, just be thinking to yourselves of something you'd like to ask our um, student researchers. Well, I'm going to start with you on this one. Um, what were some of the challenges you faced while collecting narratives from communities who have faced trauma? Right. Um, so my my demographic, I wouldn't say that I wouldn't say that they specifically faced trauma. Um, Migration within Senegal is so entrenched, they, they call it the culture of migration, that everyone feels like it's the norm um, to have someone who's migrated. So for example, um, I, had a, I was interviewing this family and one of the people in the family was a 14-year-old girl and she's never met her dad because he um, migrated while her mom was still pregnant. And so she's talked to him on Skype, she knows him very well, but not personally, not in person. Um, and so, you know, you might call that traumatic, but for her, you know, she has other friends who um, have a similar story, so it's, for her it's very normal, and she didn't mind sharing um, that aspect of her life. She, she was sad that her dad wasn't around all the time, but she also understood why he had to be away. She understood that the reason for their school fees, um, um, the reason that they have the house that they have is because her dad was abroad. Um, and so I don't think that suddenly the community that I was working with um, would consider themselves as facing trauma. Um, they would just, you know, this is a part of my life, let me share it with you. And so I didn't have any um, difficulties approaching that subject. And even those in New York that I talked to who were 
undocumented, they were totally fine sharing with me that they were undocumented. And um, I even had the head of the Senegalese community, um, Senegalese Association of America, which was like my initial spot in New York. He, um, the general manager there, he's also undocumented. And I was like, do you want me to mask your name in my research or anything? And he's like, no, like, just share my name, it's fine. So they don't feel like they're a traumatized group at all. It's a, just a very much so a part of um, their story and their lives, and they didn't mind sharing. It's interesting to talk about that, like admittance of facing trauma, because with refugee groups, it's, it's, they come with knowing that they've experienced trauma, and they're always being told that they have experienced trauma. Um, and uh, something I noticed during participant interviews was that there was always a peak in, in their story um, when they choose to face that very traumatic time in their life, and when they will, they'd be willing to share that with me. Um, so it was a matter of being patient and recognizing each individual as um, you know, a person, as a human being who has their own way of articulating this, these things. For example, um, one Sudanese <coughs> participant was a teacher in a refugee camp. So his, while this peak was you know, universal, throughout, was common throughout um, all the other interviews, his way of getting to that stage was um, he's a teacher, so he recognized, ne recognized me as a college student, and he sat down in front of a map, and he talked, and he told his story as if he was teaching and conducting a lesson, and once he reached that point and embraced that, that very traumatic, deep things that came out of his core, um, then we were able to um, move on and talk more about the problem. So that peak was um, very common throughout all the interviews, but how each individual reached that peak was very different. Um, depending on who they are and how comfortable they felt and what kind of identity they use as a vehicle to um, articulate those kind of experiences. Um, I actually had a very um, very similar experience when I interviewed one of las madres because for them their oral testimony of their loss of their children is so important to them. No matter who you are, where you're coming from, they need to tell you that story first. Um, and no matter how much research I had done before and I knew a lot about their organization and what they represented and what had happened, um, in trying to talk to one of las madres now and asking her about, you know, what does the women's movement look like today? What would you say about, you know, what has changed? Before I, I could really even ask any of those questions to her, she kind of sat me down and said, I'm going to tell you my story. This is my narrative for you. Um, and it was ex extremely important for her, not only to share it with me, but for me to understand her own background and how she decided to come and be a part of las madres, how she kind of stumbled into that that first day um, and ended up at La Plaza de Mayo. So I had to be aware um, and to be patient with them um, and to realize that you know she's going to have a story that's going to last an hour because she remembers all the details of everything that happened, not only from the disappearance of her son and her daughter-in-law, but as well as you know those days after and how she decided to first go to La Plaza and you know kind of just you know, that whole entire experience for her. So I, I quickly found that I don't know if it was a challenge, but it was just an awareness that no matter how much I, what background I had um, coming in, she knew I was this foreign undergraduate student conducting research, and so she knew that you know she was going to tell me as much as she could about her own experience. Um, but it was very beneficial, obviously. So, see, I find it interesting because I didn't specifically deal with, I would say, trauma in my research. But one of the ethical dilemmas I think I ran into was asking maybe about people's social class or what's constantly referred to as like the caste system in India. Like that's the only real ethical dilemma I ran into is because I can't walk up to someone and say, hi, I'm doing a research project. What, what caste are you again? I just really want to know. <laughs> like I couldn't just walk up to them and do that because that would be nowhere near ethical. So while it was important in my research because I wanted to see not only if gender affected these answers, but definitely if class did or social class or varna or jati or whatever word you want to substitute, but I couldn't exactly like walk up to someone and say, hi, I'm a college student. Can you reveal your social class to me? That'd be great. Can I record you? So I find it interesting like that that kind of ethical dilemma contrasted with mine, whereas it's a little trickier. Like with you with yours, you can kind of like these people were willing to like volunteer up a little bit without with mine. I could maybe parse out a little bit of social class from mine, but I couldn't like I don't think I had anyone expressly say, like, hi, I am this social class. Let me tell you all about it. 
Um, I think that's why it makes um, ethnography so fascinating and so important because, so for your example, you had to get to know them before you could ask those questions. Yeah. Um, and so that idea of participant observation that allows us to um, not necessarily become a part of the community, but for the community to get comfortable with us to then open up, that's why um, I personally like our methodology so much. Um, and then also the fact that ethnography allows us to capture the stories of the individuals and so that everyone has a story to tell. And so the way that ethnography, um, ethnography is able to approach those stories, to highlight those stories and make it the center of our research, um, I think that's really important. And I believe that's probably why a lot of our participants didn't mind sharing those um, stories of trauma, whatever level uh, we articulate trauma at um, with us. It's really interesting that we're seeing how trauma is playing different roles in identity formation and in different communities. Um, so Lena, I want to come back to you for this question um, to start with. How are you ensuring that your research benefits the communities with which you're working? Because you're talking about the need to allow people to share our trauma role in their lives. Yeah, um, I think we, as a student and a professor from a separate institution coming into refugee home, residential spaces, and telling them that we're separate from these organizations and we're talking about their very real experiences, um, we're kind of letting them trust us as people who are you know, willing through research, through ethnography, to find a solution for the problems they're facing. And a lot of the support that we, they're getting right now is through these kind of institutions, these organizations, and. Um, it, I think it was very um, emotional for them to, for s very real s individuals who don't represent really anything or any institution apart from just wanting to share these stories, wanting to hear this, these stories from them. Um, and so like they, they gave us the trust. Um, and we really, because of the nature of this, this research project, because we're asking questions that, um, that encourage them to think about their experience critically, um, they, are understanding that we're willing to do something beneficial. And all this information will be provided for the caseworkers as well, so they understand where these feelings of dissent are coming from, and um, for the refugees themselves to understand what's being done and <laughs> what the refugee um, resettlement agencies will do for, for, for uh, coming going forward. Yeah. Kavena, is, is that allowed? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 But the building trust is something that takes a long time. Uh, so what uh, we did was, before we asked the, uh, the refugee communities to tell us anything about their story, we made sure that they are not currently getting any service from the resettlement agency. Uh, so we have started working a while back uh, to establish uh, a rapport with the community, recognizing that ethnography takes a lot of time for people to honestly tell you about you know, the causes um, why you know, they, they left their home country uh, is you know, something that really uh, takes uh, a personal knowledge uh, between the researcher and the people who are uh, talking about their narrative. So uh, we, we gave them some time to uh, know us, uh, to ask us uh, you know, who we are. For example, we, we got involved through uh, voluntary work I think that was uh, one of the dilemmas, like you cannot just go and talk to the refugee communities, you have to have a certain entry point. So the entry point was uh, working with the uh, resettlement agency. Um, so uh, one uh, dilemma was to uh, let the uh, uh, refugee communities know that you know, this time we are not coming as volunteers, but we are coming <coughs> as researchers. And so to, to do that, we have to have like a gap between the time we did the volunteering work, which was uh, in the spring of 2014, and the data collection uh, happened in the spring of 2015. Uh, so what ended up uh, uh, happening is that some of the refugee communities uh, knew like when we were doing the volunteer, but they also helped us find uh, people who were also willing to share their stories with us. Uh, so it, 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 like that time span allowed us to uh, open, uh, you know, the, and how do we, uh, see uh, our role uh, because you know the narratives are important uh, to articulate like why, why for example the refugee communities think that resettlement is a long process uh, it's because they are telling you know, the, the, the narratives uh, that let them for example you know experience of trauma whether they articulate it in the form of politics or religion that might be different but to really understand them that was very useful 
So with that, we're going to open it up to, to Q&A from you guys about ethical dilemmas. So if you guys have been thinking while they've been speaking about um, questions that fall in that category that you want to ask, just go ahead and raise your hand. But when you were doing your research, how did you take into consideration your own personal uh, lens? I can start. Um, so I focus on Lutonese communities, and I'm a Nepali. And these are communities that have been ex um, living in refugee camps in Nepal. Um, so initially, um, I knew I was bounded by a couple of political perceptions of my own identity being a Nepali. Um, they would share with me dissent they had towards other Nepalis who didn't recognize their political identity. So when the question of language would come up, because they'd be conversing in Nepali, I would never want to impose a certain identity on them or expectation by speaking Nepali. Uh, so I, I came in with that kind of awkwardness, like they're speaking a language, I totally understand what they're saying right now, um, but I had to wait till they invited me to speak with them in that language, and that invitation happened when I said, my name is Lena Dahal, um, because the last name provides them a social context for them to place me, um, and that familial network and recognition of me as somebody who shares a similar culture to them and a similar language, um, but I, it, was a, it was a very, it was a very awkward realization I had, and it's something I realized I, I just have to be patient with at, during each of the interviews and just wait for that formal invitation. I think one of my biggest struggles was realizing no matter what situation I was in, I was still you know, an outsider to their world. And even when I sat in on this workshop um, about women and feminism, I sat around with you know, 25 Argentine women. And we introduced ourselves at one point so they knew that I was from the United States, that I was you know, in college and just here for the study abroad and research, research experience. Um, but I kind of let them you know, take the floor. I never brought in any of my opinions or thoughts. Um, not only because it was all in Spanish and I was very nervous about um, <laughs> that language barrier, but I just kind of let them have those conversations and I took notes and listened in. And eventually by the conclusion workshop, which is the third one throughout these three days, one of the women um, who was very vocal really wanted me to speak and she wanted me to explain what feminism meant in the United States and what that meant to me and I kind of was able to give them a little bit of a comparison. Um, but I definitely, it was definitely a struggle to realize that my perspective of what feminism means and what it means to be a woman is very different than what theirs looks like. Um, so I kind of, that was just a constant struggle as I was you know, conducting my research, writing my thesis of, am I putting my own um, you know, bias into this or am I able to really see what it means to be an Argentine woman, woman you know, in the 1970s and 80s to today um, versus what I see as myself and my own identity. Um, so that was something I just, you know, I'm always kind of struggling with, with understanding different cultures and communities that aren't my own. Um, yeah, so people ask me a lot, like, oh, yeah, you're Nigerian. Like, why didn't you do, um, why didn't you do research about Nigerian immigrants? And actually, that your question exactly is one of the reasons why I'm actually glad I didn't do research on Nigerian immigrants, because I realized I would have been super biased and, like, you know, everything people were saying, I'd be able to, like, I would understand all of the context and so be able to like spin it in such a way to explain the context, but because I'm not Senegalese and there's a lot about Senegalese culture and Senegalese life that I don't understand, I have to ask about the context. I have to let them um, show me the context. And so that made my research all the more richer because I was able to um, say the stories and then say the context like in their own words with their own um, examples and things of that nature. Um, that said, I do know when I was um, researching, especially, especially within the interview, when you're just doing the one-on-one -on -one interview, and someone says something that you, you know is like very gender biased, like, like if they like always call my name he or whatever. And so a lot of it was just like a matter of like holding your tongue really and just like not like rechecking every question in your mind to make sure that you're not asking the question with a certain bias or a certain um, type of answer that you want answered. I do know though, there was this one guy that I was interviewing and he was just something else. Um, and so I was just like, so I was like, really? So, you know, if the guy goes abroad and he can just sleep with whoever and then the girl does the same thing and it's not okay, like, just things like that. So, I mean, I wouldn't go into it that much, but he, he was just, he was just crazy. But <laughs> everybody else, I held my tongue. <laughs> I have a question. Both, is the same 
know about your final work? Like, mm -hmm. both, what do they, have they seen it? Like, how is that communicated when the river goes back? Right, right. Um, so for me personally, um, I plan to go back to the Senate Police Association of America this summer. I did make some really good friends there, um, and I plan on presenting my research to them. Um, and so we're having like a whole like event and things, hopefully. Um, and everyone will come and listen and see what I did. I know for me, I have made multiple contacts with some of the women I interviewed. Um, and one of them is this wonderful academic that was right within the same building of my program. Um, and I had a long interview with her, and she was one of the first people to say, you can, use, you can use my name, like you can use this interview, please let me know what you do with this. So I'm really excited to see her own feedback because she's been a part of um, the women's movement today, not only in the academic capacity, but she's also done the physical protest aspect, and she really sees how a lot of different components play a role in these social movements. Um, so she's definitely a specific person that I know I want to share this, feed, uh, this like my thesis with to see her feedback. Great. And with that, sorry, we're going to have to move on to the next topic. <laughs> time. Um, but we'll just have it end for any other general questions, hopefully. Um, so the next thing we're going to talk about is identity. Um, so the first sort of prompted question that we'll ask with you guys, and um, well, Lena, you'll start with this one, is um, how does one's identity influence or impact the way they view the world? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I talked about this a little um, in the last, previous question. Um, but as I said, the way people chose to share their stories um, was depending on their identity. If they were a teacher, they would stand in front of a map and dictate their story. If they were a mother, they would talk mostly about things that affected them um, due to familial related matters. Um, and it, it was just interesting how, for example, the issue of depression, um, the issue of suicide, which is common in refugee groups, um, were, was articulated diff differently based on refugee um, cultural backgrounds and identities. And for example, the Vietnamese community where suicide is very prevalent, um, they would describe the, the term suicide using um, a Nepali term that is very descriptive and invokes a lot of imagery of somebody actually dangling from the, ce the ceiling. So that choice to use that word was very based on their identity and their own cultural understandings of suicide. Um, so a lot of these problems they're facing might be common, but the way they articulate it is based on their own cultural identity. I think for me, um, I looked a lot about with the identity of being a feminist in Argentina. Um, and I came with my own understanding of what that meant. Um, and then it was kind of shifted as I was in that workshop with those women and how they defined feminism. Um, and it was really interesting to see the dichotomy between you know the women of Los Encuentros, which are presumably more liberal, more radical, um, because they're choosing to come to this meeting. Um, and a lot of them, you know, in that workshop, were talking about how they define feminism and talking about uh, anti-capitalism and anti-patriarchy. Um, and it was really interesting to see how they immediately clung to that identity as a feminist. Um, and even in my explanation, talking about how there are both positive and neg negative stigmas in the United States about what that means, some of them were a little bit surprised by that because of the way that they associate it with. Um, with being a feminist. Um, but in speaking to one of Las Madres um, in one of my interviews, um, I asked her at the end of the interview if she considered herself a feminist. And rather than saying yes or no, she immediately told me this little anecdote about how um, her partnership with her husband and how they have this um, mutual partnership and how they make decisions on their children. And for her, I interpreted it as she didn't really need feminism or what she believed what she defined feminism as, so she didn't want to identify, identify herself as that. Um, so that was something really interesting that I noticed of the way how you interpret a concept or how you are, interpret your own identity and how you choose to define yourself by that or not based on how you believe what that identity means to you. Yeah, one of the more interesting things that came up with my project in terms of identity is I would interview these women and in the back of my mind I always was thinking like, there are these Hindu texts that aren't really nice to women, what do they think about them? So a lot of my mind was constantly like, do these women identify as Hindu women or will they identify as fe women who are Hindu? And there's that kind of distinction. If they're Hindu women, they have, there's sort of an acknowledgement of a past of like sort of misogynistic, um, a sort of misogynistic past of Hinduism, which isn't that nice to women. But if they're women who are Hindu, they're prizing a female identity over a religious identity. 
And so it's a little mix of all of that. And it's kind of, I wish that was a question I thought of earlier when I, I was interviewing them. Like, would you consider yourself, or maybe something like, do you consider yourself a woman who is Hindu or a Hindu woman? And like the ramifications of them answering one way or another. And I wonder if they would have been able to differentiate either. I wonder if they'd just be like, both. I think I'm both. Because I yeah. think that depending on the context, your um, identity can be very different. And so for me, you know, with the migrants, depending on like if they were talking about other migrants or if they were talking about non-migrants, you know, the way they identified themselves um, was very different. Um, and so, for example, there was this idea of like a good migrant versus a bad migrant, but really it was really, rather than being two sides of a coin, it was more of a spectrum between the two. Um, and so in order to kind of identify themselves and make sure the world was identifying them that way, um, uh, towards, of course, people who talk to me, you know, wanted me to identify them as the good migrant, and so they always contrasted themselves to what a bad migrant would look like. And so in talking about other migrants in New York, you know, they, you know there's other migrants who, um, so a perfect example of this, sorry, I'm just trying to give you guys the best way to present this. Um, so the perfect example was this one person that I was interviewing, his name was Lamine, um, and he's been in the US for a while, and he's unemployed. And so in the spectrum for a non-migrant, telling me about um, good versus bad migrants, if you are um, migrating non-documented, you know, you would be more towards the um, scale of a bad migrant. And so there was this undocumented migrant. Um, he didn't have a job. He was still looking for one, looking for work. Um, and so again, non-migrants and other migrants who did have a job and had the legal status and whatever would be like, oh, you know, bad migrants like don't have jobs, blah blah blah. Um, but this guy was like, you know, well, other migrants like drink and smoke and chase girls, but I don't do that. So you know, just being able to contrast what other migrants would do, so therefore what bad migrants would do, poses him as that good migrant. And so just the way that he's able to articulate like what his, um, how he identifies himself and he, how he wants the world to identify him was really important. Gotcha, so I have a question that kind of surfaced a bit in your introduction to your research. Um, how do you think the, the individual identity of, of the participants you were researching factored into a larger like group identity or collective identity, whether it's um, you know, the just term migrant or if it's like the actual movement of us migrants. Like how did that individual impact how they perceive themselves as part of the group? Um, I think in my case, because um, refugee agencies tend to focus on this larger issue as the refugee problem. Um, I think we realized quickly that based on the stories, these problems are different with groups and for the Sudanese it's either religious or national, for Burmese it's political, for, um, for the Eritrean it's also political. They're, they're coming from different contexts and um, how they place each other in this larger um, term refugee has been really interesting because they're, they're sharing similar experiences but based on narratives we've collected they seem very separate. Like they're appreciative of the other movements, of the, of the existence of other groups who have shared that kind of similar trauma, but they're very separate and isolated within that community um, of their refugee group. Um, so it's, this, it's been interesting trying to see when talking to the caseworkers how they talk about refugee as this larger term and how the refugee groups understand themselves as being very isolated from this other larger, all, all the entities that exist in this larger term that is refugee. Um, so that was interesting. Yeah, mine was similar in that um, when I talked to Senegalese migrants, um, they simply identified themselves as Senegalese. They weren't comparing themselves to other co-ethnics and you know, they weren't, um, most people weren't receiving services in which they had to um, be with other um, people that were not Senegalese or, um, or in a context like that. And so they were very much so identifying themselves as um, Senegalese migrants, um, and so being able to identify with the larger group it was actually a very important aspect of being a good migrant because good migrants hold on to the idea of Senegalese as a homeland. And so the more Senegalese that you are able to act while you're in Sen while you're not in Senegal, that makes you a better migrant. But for some of the participants that I was working with, if you're too Senegalese, like while you're abroad, then like that's a bad thing. And so there's this idea. So you know we have the little Senegal, and so some people who were in little Senegal loved it because you know they're able to relate to, um, they're able to maintain their Senegalese identity even though they're New York. They still speak speak Wolof and still wear the things they wear, still wear the still eat the food that they want to eat. But other people who um, either came in and out of the community or just avoided the community altogether, they thought that you know being in Little Senegal was a little bit of a cop out. Like why would you go, why would you come all the way to New York just to stay in Senegal? 
was basically what they were saying because it was just so similar. And so there was just this dichotomy of like, to be a good migrant is um, to remain Senegalese. And you know, because even the people who were saying like, don't live in Little Senegal or like, don't want to associate with Little Senegal, they still wanted to be seen as Senegalese. They just didn't want to have to ask Senegalese all the time. And they thought that that wasn't, that wasn't really growing. Yeah. I think when looking at Las Madres, um, their mothers and they identify first and foremost as mothers. That was why they took to the streets because their children were missing and no one was telling them what was happening. Um, and I think that really helped them because a lot of them, you know, they, they choose to t retell these narratives, these really painful stories of the loss of their children. And to this day, some of them still don't know what has happened if their children are dead or alive, or, like where they are. Um, and so that's really significant, not only to the movement itself, but I think that identity as mothers um, is the way that they were able to, you know, oppose this oppressive regime because they fit within these traditional gender norms that they had grown up in and that the military dictatorship idolized. Um, and I think also with moving from that individual identity as a mother, that collective group was really, really strong in their efforts. So they began to take on, you know, share each other's stories and all of a sudden it became, I'm a mother of Argentina and therefore you're all my children, all of the children who are disappeared. Um, and so they kind of took that upon themselves to say, if I'm a mother of you know, my, my one daughter, but also of your daughter and your son and your daughter. Um, so I think that was really significant in the way that they were able to identify together. And that's why they're called Las Madres de Plaza de Mayo. Great, thank you. Um, we're going to open up to audience participation now. Um, so we're gonna... I have a question for Lena about the um, oppression media follow-up question. Um, did you, you said you did participate in observation in the communities. Mm -hmm. Were they in communities that were mixed populations or, mm -hmm. so did you get any impression of whether their identity spanned only their smaller community or whether they felt some kind of connection with refugees in general? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, this was really, really, really interesting to me because um, a lot of their house assignments were made by the organizations themselves and they would place groups with groups, trying their best to place groups with groups. Um, and for different groups, it varied, their response to that varied. Um, for the Bhutanese community, I found it really interesting that um, even though they were around people of their same identity, they felt very much alone. And this contributes to their depression, their suffering, because the resettlement agency dis defines their community as people coming from the same refugee camp or people coming from the same country, um, but they define it as the people who share their same last name, the people who share their same ethnic group, which doesn't, it's not the same thing to them. So one, one Bhutanese participant said, there's too many Bhutanese people here and I feel alone. Uh, so I think that captures just <coughs> this discrepancy between what the organizations what terms the organizations choose to use and project on communities and what how they're actually translated when in very real, very cultural contexts. Um, so that was one interesting observation. And did you notice any difference in that based on age? Um, yeah, it, whenever we enter these residential spaces, there'd be a waiting period. So we'd sit with family members um, and it was interesting, um, they'd serve us like Sprite and milk, <laughs> um, and they, it was just interesting. Even that in itself is such a cultural, um, cultural <coughs> offering. Um, this is for the Sudanese community, these are pastoral-based communities, so they're serving milk and Sprite um, as you know Americans, uh, new Americans, and it's just really, really interesting. Um, so um, I forgot your question. I was <laughs> 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 no, <laughs> wondering about the different kinds of interactions between people who came from different, yeah. either within that country or between different countries, between African mm -hmm. um, refugees and Bhutanese refugees, and how the dynamic of the community as a whole, rather than just individually, what are your narrative stories, more like, yeah. do you, are you identifying just with those people, or are you identifying with everyone in your community who is struggling to mm -hmm. become self-sufficient? So, um, as I was getting to, um, <laughs> before I started talking about milk, um, their, um, their, their community is very based on their own lived experiences. So in the Sudanese community uh, we entered, they'd, be pe they'd stick with people they share the same refugee camp with. For the Bhutanese community, they'd stick with people of that same uh, familial network. So um, their understanding of community is based on their own, own lived experiences. So even if there are many Bhutanese with them, um, 
that doesn't translate to a sense of community. So they place themselves in a very isolated understanding of community. They recognize that they live with other refugees, but they're looking for and searching for um, people and groups that translate to that very own identity, that very own lived experiences, whether it's a friend from a friend or a refugee, the same person who lived in the refugee camp, is very, very, very um, central to that singular identity and their own experience. Last follow-up, I promise. Um, so did you, did you notice, were there children in the communities yes. too? Mm -hmm. And did the children seem to have any more um, fluid an idea of what that community meant, or did the children also only concentrate on that? Um, I think based on our like limited group of participants, um, the people they stuck with or were friends from their community, but when we talked to them about their experiences in school, they're, and I said, you know, where, where we're from, they say, oh, we know someone from there. We're learning Spanish too, because there are a lot of Hispanic immigrants uh, that, that go to our school. So they're excited to embrace more cultures, but I think especially for the elderly population of refugees that are coming in and that don't necessarily, they're finding it hard to uh, grasp onto the culture that's around them. Um, they're very trying to look for that community, that whether it's familial or whether it's from the same refugee camp, that community that's very isolated. So it's, it's different, yeah. Um, this one's for Omalaya. I was wondering if you could talk about um, the sort of generational divides, um, because I know at least from the sort of uh, narrative, the immigrant narrative in America, there tends to be uh, the first generation that arrives uh, that want to cling tightly to their culture, uh, but then the second generation tends to want to assimilate, uh, and there's usually some sort of divide there. Now, you talked about sort of the idea of being too Senegalese. Does that play out across like generations? Do the younger Senegalese migrants feel that their parents might be too Senegalese and not American enough? Or, uh, yeah, I was just wondering if you talked about that. Yeah, so that was actually really interesting in the context of Little Senegal itself. So actually, most of the um, people that I interviewed who were in their 20s were in Little Senegal. And so in that, so that automatically means it was the 20-year-olds um, who identified as Senegalese, even if they were born in the US. Um, and so the main thing about Little Senegal that um, to understand where I'm going with this is um, the gentrification of Little Senegal. So Little Senegal came to be kind of like towards the end of the 90s um, when the when a lot of Senegalese migrants had moved in and they'd settled and they made 116th Street theirs. It used to be full of like prostitutes and um, gambling and all these things and one by one um, Senegalese migrants started to move there and they, um, they gentrified the place essentially and made it um, into what it is today which is you know this bustling community of, of a lot of um, Senegalese migrants and other West African migrants. But what it is is that all of the people who live there um, are more or less renting. So even those who own who own a business um, on 116th, they're renting it. But now things like Chick-fil-A and CVS want to move in. And so um, landlords are hiking up the prices so that you know Senegalese business owners have to move out, have to move somewhere else. Um, and other large companies and um, you know rich people can move into 116. So 116th is being gentrified. And so the largest disconnect that I saw, at least in New York, um, was the fact that the younger generation was like, oh, you know, the older generation really let us down. They should have been buying, um, they should have been buying all these high rises when they were cheaper because they were. At some point, um, the New York government was like um, selling them for the dollar a piece. But really, like the the truth of the matter was like it was a dollar, and they had to like, pay all the back taxes and like pay for the upkeep. So like, really, was it a dollar? No, it <laughs> but the point was, um, the younger generation was like, you know, the older generation let us down. They should have bought um, this because they had come to. They grew up in Little Senegal. They wanted um, it to be Little Senegal for themselves and their next um, their next generation as well. But the older generation was very much so like. Set, um, go to New York, go back home. Even though they ended up staying for like 40 something years, you know, it was a lot of like, go to, go to New York, go back home. And so that was the mindset that caused them not to buy um, housing in the first place. And so now the younger generation kind of feels let down by that. But what was interesting was that the older generation felt as if that felt as if the younger generation wanted to go part of Little Senegal. They say, you guys just come here, watch our TV, and leave. You guys don't you know, help, you guys don't participate, and also you guys don't understand the history of why we didn't buy those $1 houses. We couldn't afford those $1 houses because they really weren't $1. Um, and so that was the generational divide um, in New York. They really did identify Senegalese and they wanted to be a part of that community. They wanted the community to stay there, but they felt like their parents um, were kind of abandoning them and didn't think 
um, were future thinking when they um, when they were renting out places in Little Senegal rather than buying them. And so that was interesting. Um, the other generational divide that was more evident in Senegal was that um, a lot of the younger generation that I talked to, so the older generation thinks everyone wants to go abroad and just you know leave, desert Senegal, no one wants to be in Senegal and help make Senegal a better place. Rather, the, a lot of the students that I talked to, you know, around our age, a lot of them were like, you know, the U.S. isn't all that, and you know, France isn't all that. I mean, I might go and study abroad there and like maybe finish my education, but I want to come back and help my country. And so, this idea of coming back and helping my country was very evident in the younger generation, even though the older generation felt like everyone wants to leave. So there was like two genera two very different generational divides, um, but both definitely generational divides. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're gonna jump to our next theme. Um, and this is very much ties into that, I think, responses that everyone has had so far. Um, how did gender norms inhibit or unlock opportunities for further discussion on gender-related issues? And Rachel, we can start with you. Yeah, so gender played a large role in my research and my understanding of what um, traditional gender norms were in Argentina. So that was definitely something to look at it. Um, the, the gender norms that Las Madres existed within and how although they weren't attempting to kind of break within those gender norms, they weren't breaking those stereotypes at all, they were really staying within the confines of what a mother and a housewife was. Um, they really opened this space for you know, this larger feminist movement and second wave feminism to really come into play in Argentina and Latin America. There were a lot of other movements going on um, and you know, advocating and opposing other oppressive regimes, regimes that were occurring at the same time. Um, and so it's, it's interesting to see how you know, both of these movements have been able to, without you know, intentionally or unintentionally doing so, breaking what those, what those gender norms are. But I think in looking at those and speaking to women and seeing what their opinions are, it was very important for me to understand you know, where they had come from, what those gender norms looked like, and what gender norms they're trying to break. What are they trying to, how are they trying to redefine their identities as women? Um, and what is that looking like and what they want that to look like. And I think that's still a process that they're going through right now. It's still, you know, that's why they still have these conversations and these dialogues to really see where they want to go in the future. Um, but for myself, I think it was important. I think I had, I was identifying as a woman and a feminist that was beneficial for me and to be able to continue having these conversations with them because I think there was a, you know, that, that connection in itself um, was really helpful in, you know, researching with them and having those conversations. Yeah, so when you were talking about, about like sort of the history of the gender norms, sort of like the context right. they exist in, I think one of the interesting parts about me researching Hinduism is the fact that gender norms are deeply rooted in this traditional thing called, it's called pativrata, which is like your duty to be, your sort of a religiously tied duty to be the best wife you can to your husband, to I don't want to say be subservient, but that fits it very well. Mm -hmm. Sort of be subservient to the man, but also doing so in a way that is religious and is the right thing to do because it's religious. So I think acknowledging stuff like that in backgrounds, like you can't exactly prescribe Western gender norms on a community that has this like history of pativrata, which is obviously something that is a little alien to Western society in a way because it's religiously tied. So I think it's interesting investigating gender norms and I think, again, as we kind of spoke to earlier, ethnography is great for this reason, sort of investigating the context behind some things that you wouldn't normally investigate the same way. Absolutely, and I think, especially when you look at Latin America, the influence of the Catholic Church, religion has a large role in the way that, um, you know, the, the roles of the man and the woman within the family, within that private sphere. Um, so that plays a large role, and feminists today are very against the Catholic Church and these institutions because to them, they're, they're you know, creating this systematic oppression against women. So for them, it's very black and white of, you know, it's, it's because of their beliefs, it's because of their religious beliefs that we can't you know, create new gender norms for ourselves. Um, but I think it's interesting how much you know, these other institutions are playing a role in how they view themselves and then how they're you know, choosing to interact with each other. And Justin, you were talking about translating gender norms in a foreign context. Um, it was really, really interesting how there was a discrepancy between how refugee communities define freedom uh, and democracy and how the gender norms that they were bringing played into that definition. Um, for example, in the Bhutanese community, um, one participant was talking about how um, excited he is to finally have freedom, but in that very same narrative, he would talk about how his marriage was arranged when he got to the United States 
to somebody uh, he had his family lived next to in the refugee camp. So it's, it was very interesting to see how they translated these definitions, these norms um, in a foreign context, even though they were trying to navigate around this larger definition of freedom and democracy that they have been promised um, that they came here for. So it was, that was really interesting. The Senegalese population that I worked with actually faced something very similar in trying to translate those gender norms um, in very similar ways. Um, and so like I said, the Senegalese migration is very male dominated, um, but there's a lot of women who are starting to come abroad as well. You know, they first started coming to join their husbands, you know, and then like, you know, they were able to cook and whatever, but then also they found hair, but they didn't find hair braiding, but they started able started hair braiding on the side, and now hair braiding is a very lucrative business. You find hair braiding shops all around, like every corner uh, in New York City. Um, but hair braiding is a very tasking job. You know, you might be working in the shop from like 8 a.m. to 12 p.m., however long it takes to do like three to five, um, three to five clients. And, um, and so these women, you know, they'd be working all day and they would come home, maybe they'd work the same number of hours as their husbands or even more hours than their husbands and they were standing the whole time. Um, and their husband could have been like a taxi driver or he could have been standing um, doing street peddling, whatever it was. They would both come home and he would then like, you know, sit on the couch like waiting for food. And so it was just very interesting how they were expecting um, the gender norms that they're used to in Senegal to then be able to be translated right into New York even though the the working and economic norms were were switched now. You know, the woman was making more than the man, yet the man was still expecting a certain level of um, subservience, really, or uh, gender norms. I, I don't want to bias anything. <laughs> um, and so that was really interesting. And so a lot of people talked about, um, not a lot of people, a few people brought up um, the idea of how some men don't like to bring their wives to the U.S. with them because it spoils women. Bringing women to um, the U.S. spoils them because then they all know how to call 911 on their husbands, even if it's not um, legitimate. So some people talk about how like women call 911 on their husbands for no good reason, but no one ever talks about um, women calling 911 on their husbands for good reason, good reasons because. Um, not because, but the thing, uh, the reason I find that like interesting is because um, there is a, a certain um, level of like domestic violence within um, Senegalese couples in the U.S. just because of those changing gender norms and trying to navigate that sphere. Like, what do you do with it? You know, some people feel the need to like lash out about it and don't know how else to control their loose <coughs> wife or you know loose because she's making more money and doesn't want to cook now. Um, that kind of loose. <laughs> and so that was really interesting. Um, and I just really wanted to quickly touch on. Um, the idea of um, gender norms and research, so your identity as um, a researcher. And so for me, it was just this really interesting story. So, you know, usually when I go into my research site, I try to dress as conservatively as, conservatively as possible because I believe women tend to dress conservatively, um, but I don't usually go into my research site on Sundays, right? Um, just because there was like, other things I was doing on Sundays. Um, so there was one Sunday that I, had brunch with a friend and I was wearing this pink dress that was like two or three inches above my knees. Um, and then I had to, I remember there was like something I had left at the community center like a day or two before and I was like, yo, we quickly go get it, ask him a question about this big festival we're having on Monday um, and then I'll leave. And that was like the worst decision of my life because I walked into the community center and you would have thought those men had never seen knees before. It was just like really, really uncomfortable. Like, like funny after the fact, but in the moment, it was like really, really uncomfortable. And it was just interesting because they all live in New York. So I'm definitely not the first woman they've seen whose knees they've seen. But I really <laughs> would have thought I was the first woman whose knees they've seen. So that was just really interesting, like my identity as a researcher, and just like always being aware of like how you present yourself when you enter your research site. So even though I wasn't planning on going to my research site that day, um, I did end up having to, but I wasn't like appropriately dressed for it. And that was just really interesting. Justin, I'm interested in how um, you said you It was interesting because I interviewed, I think, two or three women by themselves, and I didn't really sense any, I think once they figured out I was a non-Hindu white college student, sort of, it was just like, oh, he just wants to interview me, <laughs> whatever, I'll get it over with. But the thing I found interesting was that I did interview a husband and wife pair who had just come up to me and were like, oh, we just want to talk to you because we've like, seen you interviewing people and we just want to like contribute our two cents. <laughs> and what I found interesting was that on issues of gender, the wife would just like start to say something, look at her husband, and be like, I don't know what I should say, I don't know if I should do this, and then the husband would say something, and she'd be like, yes, mm. that. And so I found that 
it was less of me, my identity as a male coming into play and more of the identity as of a male, like in the husband. Like, I don't know if I should say this to a guy around my husband. I don't know if I should say this. I Maybe mean, I should ask his permission first. So it was, that was what I was, uh, found most interesting about that. Did you have any, did you uh, interview both men and women friends? What was your um, experience navigating those differences, or were there differences? Um, I think based on what they chose to share with me as a female, um, might have been um, tailored around the fact that I was a female. They talked to me about you know, their aspirations for their children, um, their desires for um, their future as a family unit, whereas the husband would talk to me about political situations in the country, uh, the need for um, things to get better. Um, and they seemed very separate at first, so the narratives definitely were shaped by gender. Um, yeah. so, so with that, we'll open up to you guys again. Any questions? Mm -hmm. So this overlaps a little bit with ethical dilemmas and gender. So I assume that after having been doing your research for a while, you became very close to your Performance or almost to the point of being consultants at times. So, were, were there instances, this is a question for anybody, how did you maintain your neutrality when uh, you became aware of situations of oppression, for example? And whereas if you were here, you would say, you've got to do something about that. You, know, you need to, you know, you're being abused. Did you at all get involved in that? And how did you maintain your neutrality? How did you hold your time? Or did you? Um, I personally didn't have to. No one approached me with any um, stories like that. That was coming from some previous research that I had done, saying that um, abuse is a part of the is sometimes a part of the um, Senegalese couples in New York. <laughs> um, and so that comment was just based on um, previous research and not my personal research. I didn't see any couples that I felt like I should like say something about. Yeah, from talking to the case workers, uh, we were we were able to understand that you know gender-based violence is very common among the refugee communities, especially the ones who come from a patrilinear uh, social structure. Uh, but because we have talked to very few number of individuals, uh, the moment we kind of encounter uh, kind of voices of one dominating the other, uh, for example, the husband might speak about, and we uh, try to encourage was the husband and the wife to give us their perspective. So we were telling them that we are interested in hearing his perspective and also we are also interested in hearing the perspective. So instead of, uh, you know, kind of disrupting the uh, norm that exists in the family, uh, we talked about war. For example, we, there was a, um, a refugee uh, family from the Democratic Republic of the Congo where the, uh, the husband was a teacher in his own country uh, but because he has uh, some uh, physical uh, disability that the wife is now working. So in this case, we, we asked him like, about his adjustment process, and we also asked his wife uh, how his life, and then when we asked her like, how his life in Greensboro, then she started talking about her work and her children. So in that regard, like, we tried to balance the voices. But it yeah, definitely is a very important uh, the, you know, research question that you know, how do you how do you deal with it in case it happens mm -hmm. when you're doing the research? I think that one more question about gender reporting. Rachel, I'm really curious, mm -hmm. are the men in Argentina, are there any men who are supportive or members of either of these two organizations, like marched with them since they do a lot of marching? So mm -hmm. with Las Madres it was very much themselves for a while, but as they increase their numbers um, and especially today, I, they had a couple of really big marches um, during that time where their husbands or other men and children were participating in this as it became something that I think more people were comfortable in participating mm -hmm. in. Um, but in that aspect, um, for the most part, a lot of the men didn't participate, at least with Las Madres, because um, the husbands as well as the wives were very aware of if the husbands came into play and participating in these, um, these protests, they were more likely to be kidnapped and taken by the police. Um, there were instances with um, Las Madres and the police with tear gas and dogs and very violent behavior, but there was more of this disengagement in being able to do that because of the gender norms that, um, that have existed historically for them in that context. Um, with Los Encuentros, because the Encuentro itself is only for women, it is a bit exclusive, but 
um, and being a part of that march, um, at least the, the one time that I was there, I know that you know there are some men who are either watching from the sides, but there are some that did feel a little bit comfortable in joining in and participating. So I think um, it's something that's still progressing, um, but when you see bigger marches that are more public rather than kind of the exclusivity of Los Encuentros you know, on the streets of Buenos Aires, absolutely there are more men um, who are coming into play. It's still definitely a work in progress, but more men I think are um, being able to identify and realizing where this oppression is um, occurring. All right, so with that, we'll transition um, into our next topic, which is religion. Um, so this question is kind of open. Uh, we'll start with Justin, I think. What role did you find religion played um, in working with communities and cultures that differed from your own? Oh, yeah. So funny, funny anecdote before I answer that, really. <laughs> when I initially, like, was going to go to the, I was on the hour drive to carry to this temple, and something hit me. I'm just like, oh my gosh, I'm not a practicing Hindu, I'm just this college kid, how will I ever interact with these people? I must look like a complete stranger at this Hindu temple, I'm just gonna hide my head and walk through and hope something happens. But as I got there and started interviewing people, I found that once I had a shared like ritual vocabulary with them, because I had studied Hinduism before, obviously, I had no, like, I knew what I was going to talk about with them. Like, I didn't just say, can you talk about these women? I was like, I used the terms that they would use, like, sadhus and whatever. So I found that once I started to use sort of the shared ritual vocabulary, you see something change on their face, like, oh, he knows what he's talking about. I can really like discuss things with him. That's where I found that it really helped. It served as like a bridge between me and them because otherwise I there's nothing really there's nothing else. I'm just a college kid coming to interview them at their temple while they're like going about their regular Saturday. Like so I found that just like the ritual vocabulary that I could I identify with them on a religious level through the use of like the knowledge of their traditions. I know how to circumambulate a temple correctly. I know take this with the right hand, don't take this with the left hand. Like stuff like simple, well seemingly simple stuff like that really helps like build a relationship with people. Um, so what do you, what role I think uh, Justin really dealt with in and I think you know focus on that. And a lot of yours, you know, didn't directly address religion. But what role did you find religion played um, in the, the lives of your informants? I think for some of my informants, um, religion had more of an importance than others. Um, in one case, for a Sudanese participant, he prayed before he shared his story. Um, and the mm -hmm. the hierarchy in when you talk about the organization and his resettlement process, and then God was was apparent. So he would talk about God being the reason, reason for his self-adjustment um, of self-sufficiency and separate that narrative from that of the organization. So it was interesting seeing where different uh, participants placed God in relation to the organization. Yeah, also just <coughs> as a follow-up, yeah, even though like three individuals came from the Dhaka region, uh, the way they articulated um, you know, religion was different. Like one person said, like he was persecuted in Darfur for his religious belief uh, because you have, you know, the Norse uh, in Sudan who live in Islam, they tried to impose on the Darfurians. So for him, like religious freedom was the most important thing. Then for another Darfurian who is also a Muslim, got persecuted, but he still uh, finds religion as an important way of uh, building uh, networks uh, for himself, like in real sport. And then uh, another person who lives in animism from the same Darfur region, uh, he also talks about the importance of religion for him, like how, you know, in the sense of community. So it's, if the three of them, they are coming from the same region, but the way they see religion uh, overall is a very uh, uh, positive thing. One, one could be like religious freedom, but the other one could be like use religion to adjust to the new environment. I think it's in the too. For mine, it was mostly just about using religion to um, adjust to the new environment. No one, no one really, what did I say? Okay, so basically that, back to that spectrum of the good versus the bad migrant, the good migrant kind of holds on to the traditional Senegalese values, and for them, part of those traditional Senegalese values 
were also mm -hmm. entrenched in traditional Islam, um, Islamic values. And so someone who was able to remain Muslim and you know still practice, even though they were in New York, was considered a better Muslim. But it really wasn't brought up that, that often um, in my field work. But I do know that um, the history of Senegalese migration to New York um, started with the Muridia, um, which is an, um, an Islamic brotherhood underneath the Sufi sect. And so they're very prominent um, brotherhood within Senegal, although they're not the biggest. The Tijani is actually the biggest, but more researchers research the Murid because they're usually the most organized. And they're able, their, their um, trade networks and their migration networks are very, very visible. Um, and so that kind of um, helped in the resettling and also the networking and being able to integrate into the um, US and other communities that um, Senegalese migrants have resettled in, in Italy and Spain and France. They've been able to use their religious networks to get them abroad. Rich, you spoke a bit about earlier the how the relation between the feminist organizations and movements and Catholicism. Can you talk a bit more about that and, and how that's I guess changed um, since you know the, the movements in the seventies and eighties and like to the present day, how that relationship? Is, yeah, absolutely. Um, I had a really interesting experience when I was a part of that big commemorative march, Los Encuentros, because what they choose to do at every year is to end. They go through throughout the more or less rural town that they're in, um, and they choose to kind of step away from the capital city of Buenos Aires um, when they can and take other, and utilize other areas for each encuentro um, because it's more, there are more conservative families and conservative, conservative ideals, um, and there's the understanding that there's a bigger influence of Catholicism in those areas. Um, and with that, they usually end at that Catholic church, whatever church is like kind of that prominent spot in that town. And I didn't really know that was going to happen, that we would do this hour and a half, two hour march and end there. And very quickly you saw the difference between um, women who were, you know, just marching and, en and enjoying this really empowering moment and the more radical, I would assume they identify as feminists, um, the radical women, because all of a sudden there was this grocery cart with a, like a fake figure of the Pope um, on fire. So for them, it's really, really significant the influence of the Catholic Church on what their ideas of um, women's rights and that oppression. Um, so for them, you know, religion is a negative thing because it's been a part of their historical context. Um, and for them, it's, it's not OK that there, there is this influence of the Catholic Church. Um, when they're, they have this law right now in Argentina about enforcing sexual education in private and public schools, it's not necessarily being enforced properly. How do you regulate what you teach children, especially in private schools that have a religious um, affiliation? Um, so, the, and as well as the idea of abortion, they're trying to make it free, secure, and legal in Argentina. And a lot of these women see a direct correlation between the Catholic Church's influence on the state and other institutions, and the fact that um, the Catholic Church ne not necessarily believes in abortion um, and that right for women. So, for them, it's there's this really big disassociation. They're very, very much against the Catholic Church, but I don't, I don't think I realized that until the end of the march and I saw what was happening. Um, so that was really an interesting experience for me. And so with that, we want to open it up to um, my participation. Do you have a question? Um, yeah, I have a question for Shifty. So I was wondering how the Los Angeles and Los Mages have evolved or progressed over the last 30 years, considering with the political movements and then with Christina being president and how like, mm -hmm. there's a feminist and, uh, you know, person in power, and then also in the religious aspect now that the Pope is from Argentina. Right. So. Um, I actually went abroad with Catherine, so we've had these types of conversations <laughs> before. Um, but it's very interesting to see, especially Christina as president right now, and I actually <coughs> presented at a conference, and a lot of people came up to me and said, oh, but aren't things, aren't, aren't things going great? They already have a woman president. I said, yes, that's true. She actually, although she was elected individually, she did kind of come into power from her, um, her late husband, um, who was in power prior to her. But there's not a lot of women in government that are really being represented. So there is this, you know, you've got that head, head president as a female, but that doesn't mean necessarily women's voices are really being heard. Um, I didn't really talk to people a lot about the influence of the Pope being Argentine, besides everyone loving the Pope. And they're <laughs> um, huge advocates. I think the Pope and Messi are the two biggest people that they advocate <laughs> for in Argentina. That was definitely something very noticeable. Um, but it, has, it was very interesting 
the evolution of especially Las Madres and what they want to do. You know, it's been they've celebrated over 30 years of democracy. They haven't had another regime, thankfully. Um, but we're now looking at, you know, where do Las Madres want to go with what their work is and you know, do they want to do something associated with Los Encuentros and how do they want to move forward in preserving the memory of their children besides they have these huge archival offices to document everything, but how are they moving forward? They were, um, I actually got to volunteer with them every week um, with two other students from my program. And we were kind of the only young people in that office besides um, one of the daughters of one of uh, the original madres who had passed away and a couple of them would come in and they have their like cafecitos um, every week and, and they would talk to us. But besides that, we didn't have young Argentines. So I was really trying to see how they would move that forward. Um, and so I guess we're kind of waiting to see what they want to do with that, so. Any other questions? Can we stop there? Yeah, I have a um, this one is for Omelia again. Um, so did you find that uh, the, how do I say this? Uh, did you find that religion, that, that the Senegalese migrants being Muslims, did you see that that could be alienating from the larger sort of New York community? I mean, there's sort of, very much a prominent uh, Islamophobia mm -hmm. um, that sprang up in the United States, um, and I was wondering if that that was alienating to them at all. Honestly, it didn't seem like it. No one talked about being oppressed by the larger um, New York community, um, and also no one no one um, really talks about feeling like they couldn't practice Islam. There's a mosque very close to the Senegalese, um, very close to Little Senegal. Their large mosque um, has since closed down because due to gentrification and not being able to maintain the rent. Um, and other than that idea of the mosque not being able to stay open, um, the larger mosque, there's, smaller, there's another smaller mosque still on the street that people go to. Um, so other than the large mosque closing down, due to rent and not due to like people protesting or anything. That was the only time people brought up um, not being able to practice as easily as they would want to. Um, and so it didn't really seem um, like people felt as if they were oppressed or not able to practice. Um, and actually the reason the Assemblies community was able to establish itself so well was because of um, in, in the 80s where there were a lot of um, African American Muslims um, helping them resettle and also like wanting to practice the religion and, be able to practice the religion together. Um, that was one of the reasons that the Senegalese community was able to settle the way they did. And so being um, Muslim actually helped them when they were initially um, resettling. And now no one really seemed to be plugging um, into that idea other than, I just remembered, another <laughs> um, one other problem that was brought up was the idea of not being able to immigrate. And so some people kind of identify, you know, like the whole, all the, immigration laws that came up after 9-11 as being like one of the reasons it was harder to get documented and even though they wanted to be legal and wanted to um, be able to participate in the U.S. economy, they felt because of the immigration laws and what they are today, it makes it just that much harder to be able to go back and forth between the and the U.S. or even just make a living for yourself in the U.S. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so with that, we're going to move on to our last theme, which is immigration. Um, and we'll let everyone start with you again. How is immigration conceptualized across communities and cultures that you work with? Um, okay, so, so I only work with one community really, but I think um, it's just back to the idea of like, do you consider yourself a good migrant or a bad migrant? And so we like to imagine all migrants as just this like one, you know, migrants, like that's what they are, but individually they're all looking for different things. Um, they're all, some are planning to stay for X amount of years, um, some came because of education, not everyone, some came for economic reasons, some came to join um, their family. And so people's understanding of where they stand as a migrant is very, very different even if we all see them as a migrant. So for example, one of the first few people that I interviewed when I was in New York, not sorry, not New York, Senegal was um, one of my professors, her name was Gamo. You're gonna have her, um, she's great. <laughs> um, so basically for her, she had come to the US, um, she went to Kalamazoo College in Michigan, um, and she went as a student. And so for her, even though she ended up staying in the US for 10 years, because after she finished college, she got a job, and then she went back to grad school, and then like got another job, and then came back to Senegal. For her, she the whole 10 years that she was in the US, she never considered herself a migrant. And so that what she considered herself is very important when we start thinking of like 
how we label individuals and the types of services that we want to provide them. You could probably talk about this a little bit later. Um, and so that was just the main thing, how people um, understood the idea of a migrant. Um, and then that is best, that is most evident in this um, idea of a modu modu. So modu modu um, is this term that um, came from the Murid Brotherhood when they were moving from um, moving from rural parts of Senegal to the car and then eventually to other countries. And so a modu modu is this person who comes from a certain region of Senegal that um, has a lot of people from the Luridia um, Brotherhood. And um, they're very much known for being like very hardworking and very um, devoted to their religious leader known as a marabou. Um, and so, but the, mo the bo mo the mo modu modu historically are not educated, don't know French very well, but still despite that, they're able to go abroad, work hard, make money, and they come back, you know, these really rich um, individuals and they're able to like, display the wealth that they were able to gain abroad. Um, and so it was interesting talking to individuals in Senegal who had varying perceptions of the modu modu. So some people still idealize the modu modu and how like, you know, they're very hardworking, you know, they're great and others, you know, kind of chose to concentrate more on the fact that they were uneducated and like, you know, of a lower socioeconomic status and, you know, that kind of validated whatever money they brought and was probably brought, um, the money was probably fake anyways, maybe they just maxed out their credit card and they're just pretending to be rich. And so it was just interesting, um, the different ways that people perceive these like historically um, heroic individuals, but now as we're seeing, you know, the economic crisis around the world, but then also the way immigration is changing, um, the idea of like, do we idealize the modu modu, or are they just, you know, like a lost cause or whatever it is? Um, that was very interesting in how people um, identified themselves, but then also identified other people. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, no, I've been talking about this, you know, grouping people a lot um, and how a lot of these experiences and the elasticity of identity is just pushed into one term, that migrants, refugees, uh, that they have to navigate around. So I, I definitely see connections. Um, another question, like, what did you guys see as, um, like, the, was there any kind of hierarchization within the immigrant communities you were speaking with between maybe, like, gender or religious differences or immigration status, perhaps, do you see any kind of ways that identity played into immigration and acculturation? Okay, um, definitely for me, especially this idea of um, legal migration, if there's this idea that um, legal migration is becoming less and less accessible <coughs> to the people who want it because of our very stringent immigration laws, um, and so both the people in Senegal who had not yet migrated and the people in New York who had migrated legally. They very much so didn't, it's hard to explain because they didn't necessarily look down on people who were undocumented. They understood the desperation for wanting to go abroad at all costs and helping your family. They very much so understood that, but they would say, you know, I don't understand why you would ever do that. Like, you know, you really shouldn't. It's better to just stay in the US, particularly because um, Immigration officials are very, very um, condescending. Yeah, I think that's the best word. Immigration <laughs> officials, they, yeah, they, um, immigration officials are very condescending. So they, a lot of people in um, Senegal were like, no, I don't want to migrate because I don't want to have to be dehumanized like that. I don't want to, you know, have to explain everything. And you know, they kind of grow me with questions anyways. And so they didn't really understand why anyone would bother trying to migrate with all those barriers in place. Um, and then also those in New York. Um, particularly would point to the um, non-documented migrants as saying like, you know, they really should just go back and, you know, that's the best bet. Like, even though there's this shame for uh, associated with going back without having achieved this El Dorado narrative that I was talking to you guys about. Um, and so this idea of like, you have to go back and prove that you did a good job while you were abroad. And so to have done a good job means that you got a good job, you made money, and you were able to come back and present that riches back to your family and your community. And so if you weren't able to do that, a lot of times it's perceived as you were lazy, um, you didn't you know, work hard enough, as opposed to just like the economic situation and the legal situation that prevented you from being able to do so. And so some people were very in tune with that idea, but they were very aware that the larger <coughs> Senegalese community was not in tune to that, and that you're looked down upon if you don't come back with an Eldorado, Eldorado narrative. And so therefore, it's hard to come back with an Eldorado narrative if you're there illegally. Um, and so therefore, being there legally is also looked down upon 
You know what I mean? And so like, no one is ever gonna like talk bad about someone who's undocumented, but they will kind of circumvent that conversation and pose them as being looked down upon without saying that they're looking down upon them. Yeah. Yeah, you talk about, you're asking about hierarchy. Um, it was interesting because this is kind of a shared experience. They're going through the same paperwork. Mm -hmm. They're subject to the same checklist of things that the caseworkers are trying to help them with. So the assistance is the same, but the way they navigate around it, um, the way their, their priorities, expectations they come with all differ um, based on their identity and culture groups. So it, it was interesting to see how they were prescribed a certain um, standard list and how their ex own expectations which were different, um, translated to that to those lists and how they responded to those lists. Did um, any of the communities, communities that you were working with, did they, um, how did they feel like they related to people who were immigrants as opposed to refugees, or did they kind of feel like they were all one group? You mm -hmm. know, the, even though their, their paperwork is definitely a little bit different and their processes are a little yeah. bit different, a lot of times I feel like in our heads, um, as people who aren't in tune to the migration and refugee literature, we tend to uh, put immigrants and refugees yeah. and asylees all in one mm -hmm. box. Um, I think it was really, really, it's again very different in each community, but very interesting how, because one thing that do, does bind these two groups together is the search for home and the right. search for community right. within this foreign place. Um, so for example, the Bhutanese community in Greensboro doesn't have a temple to worship in, but they, they work with the Tibet, Tibetan um, community, immigrant community in prayer and worship in their kind of um, communal services. So there's there's overlaps, but it's not it's not the same. Right. Right? So I think also something else that facilitates the otherness of between refugees and Im immigrants is uh, the fact that they're placed in residential spaces with other refugees. Mm -hmm. So it, it, yeah. Yeah, and I think perhaps, I don't know if you noticed this, but for me, this idea of being able to go home was very important and very real. So um, in what I've read, for a lot of refugees, um, going home isn't isn't about to happen anytime soon, mm -hmm. but for Im for the Senegalese immigrants, you your end goal was always going home. So even if you've been in the US for 40 years, you were gonna retire back in Senegal, and even if you died in the US, your body was gonna get shipped back to Senegal. So regardless of what happened, you were gonna end back in Senegal one way or another. <coughs> and so for them, that idea of home as the end goal, it kind of helped them have one foot in the US and have one foot back in Senegal. Whereas I wonder, that was probably very different for the yeah. refugees you're working with. Yeah. They had this very real understanding that home wasn't an option, and they had to find a home in the US. Right. Um, so it's, it's it's same, same, but different. Um, right. So it's, yeah. So similar, like, resettlement type of, oh, sorry. We have like two minutes for at least final questions for you guys. Um, we're going to head out, out of here. <laughs> yeah, I can mention safety. Um, I was wondering, you y'all, most of y'all mentioned that you have plans to bring your research back to the communities, but I was wondering if some a part of your process is in the middle of your analysis, bringing things back to people and being like, hey, is this what you meant? Or like having, are, are the participants playing any part in your finalization of your analyses? Well, I took it in yesterday, so no. <laughs> <laughs> um, but while I was working through it, um, the beauty of ethnography and participant <coughs> observation is that you're there for a while. And so you have multiple conversations with people and that, so even if you don't like re-show them the transcript of what they said, you know them well enough and you like revisit questions enough times to know, get a feel for if you're representing their story the way that they would want their story represented. I feel like for me, I was constantly accumulating as much information as possible from everyone. So whether or not I was sitting down and having an interview, I have you know dinner conversations with my host mom, who is a single mom with two kids. Um, it's just this vivacious woman and very smart and loved to tackle really interesting United States issues with me in Spanish. So it was definitely an interesting, she's a very political woman um, and has a lot of opinions. So I love to watch those fights but I, uh, between herself and her 23-year-old son. But I was accumulating information just by listening to them and listening to how they felt about the politics that were going on on TV and what, culturally things, what cultural things were happening at the time. Um, so for me, whether or not it was official, I was still being able to like, like just by being there for five months, I felt like I learned so much about um, the culture and the community as a whole. I have a question. Oh, so I, I'm just curious about the narrative that took place when someone visited home. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
how did that kind of fit into the larger context of some of the things you mentioned, like El Dorado or other mm -hmm. you know, points of? So that is a really, really great, great question. I definitely did spend a portion of my paper talking about that. And so, like I was saying, there's this idea of even if, so even if no one believes in El Dorado, um, apparently, there's still this um, pressure to present that the fact that you succeeded, the fact that you weren't just being lazy, that you did make it um, while you were, that you, that you were um, making money while you were abroad. And so some people felt that, um, pressure in the fact that maybe they had to break home presents a lot, you know, and so I was actually able to go to downtown New York with one of my friends who was preparing to return to Senegal, and I watched as she, like, expanded and um, unexpanded her list, and so she was trying to decide, like, who to buy for, um, and so a lot of that was based on, like, how close she was with people, but then also, like, what social, um, social capital she was trying to gain. So for example, there was a boyfriend that she had just started dating back in Senegal, um, and he had a few friends that she didn't really know very well, but she still bought all his, her friends wa all his friends watches to, you know, as a way of being like, hey, you know, I'm, I was in America, I was thinking about you guys, here are some presents. That said though, people grumbled, is that the word? Grumbled about having to buy so many presents because people expected the presents. You know, people expected them to come back with all these presents and, you know, show off being in America, and so even though they didn't want to show off that they were in America, they felt that they had to show off that they were in America, Although, because if they didn't, then people would say, oh, you weren't thinking about me, or oh, you were lazy, or oh, what were you doing, things of that nature. And so that was one narrative, having to play up the El Dorado, even though all the while you're trying to say, no, 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 the El Dorado doesn't exist, but like, here's some shoes. You know what I mean? So very, very hard, because you, you have to show that you are hardworking, but you also have to show that you are humble, you know, that you haven't made that much, because then if you show, come off as too um, extravagant, then people are going to ask you for more things. And so try to find that balance between um, meeting the social expectation to present riches, but then also not showing too many riches in, um, and then showing off, basically. Um, and then the other part, sorry, what was that? Right. <laughs> and then the other part was how Senegalese um, are you? You know what I mean? Are you able to go back to Senegal and still be 100% Senegal, or are you going to be a snooty American? You know what I mean? And so this was um, and uh, something that, so for example, say he, he was talking to me, and he was like, you know, when I go back to Senegal, I just, you know, I dress just like everybody else, and you can't even tell that I'm um, from America, except for all my friends are darker than me. <laughs> I thought that was really funny. And so it was just this idea, <laughs> it was just this idea of like, being able to go back to Senegal, and even though you brought back money, or you brought back a phone for your mom, or whatever it was, um, you're still just as Senegalese as everyone else who didn't leave. And so that was really interesting. Awesome. That's all the time we have for <laughs> If you're dying to ask another one, you might be able to snag panels before they leave. Um, let's give it up for our <laughs>